Is it possible to have multiple sclerosis but no symptoms? What you're looking at is the MRI scan of a 15-year-old girl. The scan was done for fever and sleepiness, later determined to be caused by an infection completely unrelated to the MRI findings. So this truly is an incidental finding. Her examination was completely normal and she denied any history of neurological symptoms whatsoever, yet her scan is highly consistent with multiple sclerosis. You can see this lesion in the right splenium of the corpus callosum, this large, well-demarcated periventricular lesion. On some other slices, we can see subcortical lesions and a juxtacortical lesion, highly, highly consistent with multiple sclerosis. But does she have MS? No. As discussed in a prior video, link in the description below, the diagnostic criteria of multiple sclerosis requires symptoms. What she has is known as RIS, or radiologically isolated syndrome. But what is RIS? Is it MS? How likely is it to turn into MS? And how common is it? And should we treat it? I'll show the results of multiple randomized controlled trials, some other references in the notes below. And remember what John Haywood said, don't put the cart before the horse. And by the way, I got those MRI scans of the 15-year-old girl from a case report with 18 years of follow-up. So we'll see how she's doing at age 33 at the end of the video. Now, RIS is becoming more and more common simply because we're doing more and more MRI scans for various reasons. This study looks at the annual number of MRI scans per 1,000 people in the population in three different countries. And you can see the rate of MRI scans is going up and up, particularly in the United States, almost one in 10 people has an MRI scan in a given year. Now, these aren't all MRI scans of the brain. They're MRI scans for various body parts. But you can see when we do more scans, we're going to pick up more incidental findings, including RIS. This study looks at various reasons people might get an incidental finding on an MRI scan. The most common by far is headache, but some other reasons include trauma, epilepsy, tinnitus, and even being in a research study, some people get an MRI scan as part of a research study and incidentally discover something such as RIS. So let's review some general facts about RIS. As soon as MRI scans became available to the public in the 1980s, people started reporting this phenomenon, MRI lesions consistent with MS without a diagnosis or symptoms. The prevalence in the population, depending on the study, is around 0.1%, 1 in 1,000 to 0.7%. Note this is much less than the prevalence of multiple sclerosis in high prevalence countries such as the United States, multiple sclerosis. So for a neurologist such as myself, I don't see a ton of RIS. MS is much more common. So most people who have MRI scans with lesions consistent with MS do have some symptoms. So this is definitely a less common phenotype. Now, one interesting study looked at family members, healthy family members, in other words, people without neurological disease, of people with MS, and they found that 2.9% have RIS. Now, the first degree relative of someone with MS, like a sister, brother, parent, or child, has around a 3% risk. They looked at various relatives, some of which have relatively low risk, such as the grandchild or niece or nephew of someone with MS, has only around a 1% percent risk. So 2.9 percent is fairly high. And this has been reported in identical twin studies where maybe one twin has MS and the other doesn't. But some of the twins have RIS because they were doing MRI scans in these studies. Now, RIS isn't necessarily completely benign because it can be associated with atrophy or shrinkage of the brain and axon or nerve fiber loss and even cognitive changes. And one study looked at cognitive function doing formal cognitive cognitive testing on people with RIS, and about a third had some degree of cognitive impairment. So is it really without symptoms just because the person with IRS didn't report the symptoms? Now, it's difficult to define RIS. Vaguely speaking, RIS is the MRI scan looks like multiple sclerosis, but the individual doesn't have any symptoms or history of symptoms. But a few doctors have 
try to define it, which is necessary for doing clinical trials because you have to have an inclusion criteria. This is Dr. Darren Akuda, who created the Akuda RAS criteria, and he describes the MRI characteristics, saying there should be ovoid or oval shaped lesions that are well circumscribed. They can be with or without involvement of the corpus callosum, which is a common location of multiple sclerosis lesions. Then he uses the Barkoff criteria, an older criteria for MRI scans in multiple sclerosis. I won't go into the technical details there. And he mentions a few other things, such as the white matter lesions are not caused by something else, like they look like vascular disease. Many people in the general population have some degree of subcortical white matter lesions not consistent with multiple sclerosis that could easily be misinterpreted. He says there are no symptoms, and the MRI scans don't cause any impairment of social or occupational functioning, like there's significant cognitive impairment, in which case maybe the individual just has multiple sclerosis, they're not caused by toxins, and there's no other disease. There's another doctor, Dr. Josephine Swanton, who has her own criteria, the Swanton RAS criteria. Now, she's a little bit more broad in her definition. She says there just have to be at least one lesion in two different areas, periventricular, around the ventricle, juxtacortical, right next to the cortex, infratatorial, in other words, the brainstem, or in the spinal cord. So just two lesions in different areas will suffice. I like this definition better because it's a little bit broader, and I think that it depends what you want to do with the clinical trial. Maybe, for instance, Dr. Akuda just wanted to exclude people with a very small number of lesions, and again, she says there are no symptoms or history of symptoms, and the MRI findings are not caused by something else entirely. Now let's look at the MRI findings of people with RAS in six different cross-sectional studies. And you'll look at the different features, gadolinium enhancing or active lesions, people who have more than nine T2 lesions, infratentorial or brainstem lesions, spinal cord lesions, juxtacortical lesions right next to the surface of the brain or greater than three paraventricular lesions. And you can see many people have active lesions. So in this study, 9 out of 30, 10 out of 41, 17 out of 70, 13 out of 60. So active lesions are fairly common even in RIS where people have no symptoms. What about greater than nine lesions? So if someone has two or three lesions, that's a very low lesion burden. Of course, many people with MS have 50 or 100, but greater than nine is pretty significant. And you can see most of the people do have greater than nine, 21 out of 30, 44 out of 44, 63 out of 70, just to give a few examples. What about infratentorial or brainstem lesions? They're very common, 10 out of 30, two out of four, six out of 12, 17 out of 60. What about spinal cord lesions? Pretty common, 5 out of 12, 18 out of 60. Juxtacortical lesions, 2 out of 4, 12 out of 12, 60 out of 60. And what about greater than 3 periventricular lesions, 4 out of 4, 11 out of 12, 60 out of 60. So you can see the MRI findings are very typical of people with multiple sclerosis. But will these people actually eventually get multiple sclerosis? I'll show the actual statistics on the next slide. These are the risk factors for conversion to multiple sclerosis. Hazard ratio, or HR, is the risk relative to people without that risk factor. For instance, age less than 37, being 36 or younger, quadruples the risk of getting multiple sclerosis if you have RAS. Being male seems to be a risk factor. Having spinal cord lesions increases the risk of getting MS five-fold, hazard ratio 5.11, infratentorial or brainstem stem lesions, active enhancing lesions doubles the risk of MS, high lesion load in general, and having abnormal visual evoked potentials. This is an electrophysiologic test to look for old optic neuritis. I'll show the results of different clinical studies on the risk of getting MS if you have RIS. Again, links in the description below for references. So one study found that the risk was only one in three, 33% over five years. So most people with RIS are doing fine. There was a very good study at the University of California, San Francisco, and they found that there was radiologic progression, in other words, new lesions if they did follow-up MRI scans, in 59%.
but only 10 and 44, the minority, actually had clinical events. Although UCSF is a tertiary care center, people may be traveling long distances to see them, and they note the follow-up was very incomplete, potentially biasing the study. However, amongst people who had spinal cord lesions, 84%, 21 out of 25, did have a clinical attack, and the median time to attack was only 1.6 years after the identification of RIS. So you can tell someone, if you're going to have an attack, it's most likely going to be within a few years. Now, this is data from a French MS registry. You can see the French name here. They found that only 13.8% had attacks within two years. Definitely the minority. Most people are doing fine. But they looked at risk factors, and they identified three main risk factors, having spinal cord lesions, having active lesions, and being young, under age 37. And they found if you had two risk factors, the risk was 27.9% of getting MS after two years. And if you had all three risk factors, in other words, spinal cord lesions, active lesions, and you were young, the risk was 90.9%, very high risk. There was another study, this is a worldwide cohort study from 21 different databases, and they found a 51.2% risk of conversion to MS with a 10-year follow-up, although the median follow-up was 6.7 years. So around half get multiple sclerosis, but around half are stable and have no attacks. Now, most people, if they get MS, they get relapsing MS, but a small number directly convert to primary progressive MS. In other words, they never had an attack in their life, and they just slowly start getting worse. Unusual, but it has been reported. And just to provide one additional data point, this is a meta-analysis of RIS from 2012, looking at various studies. And I added up all the numbers, and I got that 116 out of 325, or 36%, had a clinical event, in other words, progressed to multiple sclerosis during the follow-up period. Of course, these are various researchers, various lengths of follow-up. And frankly, to be honest, I don't necessarily have a ton of confidence in people's ability to include and exclude the right individuals. And there may be some people included in this study who don't really have RIS. They have an MRI scan with different subcortical white matter lesions, maybe more consistent with unidentified bright objects discussed in a different video, which I'll link in the description below. That may sound arrogant, but that's just my opinion. I suspect if the MRI lesions are in fact highly consistent with multiple sclerosis, the risk is probably a little bit higher than this. But perhaps the more important question is, if you have RIS, what should you do? It's got to be scary to be told you have an MRI scan that looks like MS, and someday you may develop the symptoms of a serious disease. But should you take disease-modifying therapy? Historically, very few have. This is data on the percentage of people taking disease-modifying therapies in various studies. You can see the dates are between 2008 and 2011. So so maybe things have changed, but you can see 3 out of 30, 7 out of 44, 0 out of 11, 0 out of 22. Essentially, almost everyone is untreated. After all, there's no evidence for using disease-modifying therapies in people with RIS, or is there? Well, believe it or not, there are two randomized controlled trials that have been completed, and one ongoing addressing this exact topic, treating RIS. The first I'll show you is the ARISE trial. This is a randomized controlled trial of Tecfidera, a twice-daily pill for MS versus placebo in people with RIS. Tecfidera is generally considered to be a low efficacy medication, and 240 milligrams is the standard dose. This was done at 12 centers with 96 week or approximately two years of follow-up, and the outcome was time until the first clinical attack. In other words, developing multiple sclerosis, a great clinical outcome. And you can see the results here. I apologize for the poor resolution. You can see Tecfidera in yellow and placebo in light blue. Blue. This is a survival curve of the people who remained attack free. So it started at 100% and it goes down slowly. You can see very few people getting Tecfidera had an attack, but a significant number of people getting placebo did, but still less than 50%. You can see the 50% line here. In fact, Tecfidera was highly effective with an 82% relative reduction 
in the number of people who had their first clinical event. But of course, many of the people getting placebo did fairly well. And of course, I'd be concerned about some people with RRS who would not develop multiple sclerosis naturally even after many years. Do you really want to expose them to medication, perhaps unnecessarily? Now, I'll show you a different study on RRS. This is Abagio versus placebo, the Terrace study. And I just saw the results of this days prior to the filming of this video. Again, this is a randomized controlled trial with 125 participants, and the primary outcome was the same time until the first attack. They found that Abagio treated individuals had 62% risk reduction, p-value 0.025, statistically significant, relative to placebo in getting the first clinical event, in other words, the first attack. In terms of MRI findings, it was not as robust, 69% fewer active or gadolinium enhancing lesions, not statistically significant p-value 0.087, and 30% fewer T2 lesions, newer enlarging T2 lesions with Abagio relative to placebo, p-value 0.31. It's unusual that the MRI findings were not statistically significant, but I think they didn't do a lot of MRI scans in this study because they wanted it to be a clinically focused study. One thing I would point out about both of these studies, both for Tecfidera and Abagio, is that the results were actually better than the randomized controlled trials in multiple sclerosis. In other words, these drugs seem to be even more effective in RIS than they are in MS, but of course, perhaps we're treating some people unnecessarily. And there's one more study on RIS, Ocrevus versus placebo, the Cello study, 100 participants. This is an academic study, so they may not have the resources of a pharmaceutical company, and so it won't be completed until 2028. And I'll also throw in my personal opinion, although I don't doubt the results of these drugs and these studies, they certainly are effective, Abagio and Tecfidera, can't argue with the results, I personally probably wouldn't recommend them to the majority of people with RRS. Of course, treating early is good, preventing disability is good, but giving people unnecessary medication, particularly for a prolonged period of time, is very bad. These are two-year studies, but what do you do after two years if you're stable and you have no new lesions and no attacks? Do you continue on the medication? Do you continue for 20 years, 30 years? It puts us in a very difficult situation. Sometimes I think it's better to just let the disease declare itself. Now, I probably would recommend these medications to someone I consider to be higher risk, like someone who had spinal cord lesions, very high lesion burden, numerous active lesions, or if I thought possibly they had subtle symptoms of multiple sclerosis like cognitive cognitive impairment, and they weren't truly asymptomatic. But of course, talk to your own provider for personal advice. And of course, I'll end the video by telling what happened to the 15-year-old girl. This is a diagram of her history over 18 years, and you can see the dates on the bottom. On the left side, you see the number of MRI lesions on each scan. And on the right, you can see the EDSS expanded disability status scale or her level of MS-related disability. And you can see that she had low disability, the green line, throughout the duration of the study. EDSS of 6 means a cane is required to walk 100 meters. EDSS of 3 or 4 would be considered moderate disability, and she was at 1 or 1.5. So she initially did not receive treatment, and she had follow-up MRI scans, which showed new lesions. She had a spinal tap, which showed oligoclonal bands, or antibodies in the spinal fluid unique to the cerebral spinal fluid, the finding seen in about 90% of people with MS but she was asymptomatic. She then started an interferon drug, but she decided to stop it multiple times, but each time she stopped it, and you can see the gap in treatment, she had an MRI scan showing new lesions. So it became clear if she didn't take the drug, she had new lesions, but was essentially asymptomatic. And so she restarted the drug and continued on it and was stable ever since that time and even had a healthy pregnancy and delivered a child in 2019. 
19. And she continues to take now pegylated interferon, which is plegrity, to this very day and is generally doing well. They note that she has EDSS of 1.5 with brisk reflexes and difficulty doing tandem gait, that's stepping one foot directly in front of the other. And having difficulty doing that is a little bit abnormal for a 33-year-old. If you're 60, of course, we'll let it slide, but she's generally doing very well. I'd be interested to know if you have RIS, how did you find out? How did you get that first MRI scan and what are you doing? And do you have any general questions? Please definitely take a look at the sources in the notes below. And do you have any suggestions for future videos?